The three of us ride through the early night, the warm summer wind brushing around us in the cheap convertible. We finally make it to our destination, a road far in the middle of nowhere, twisting, turning, beautiful manicured gardens leading up to a mansion, our next target. We leave the van and Hal and I scout the outside of the ostentatious house. After a round of scouting, we meet back up. Hale has found our way in. Next, Hal works to disarm the security system. I scout the exit route while Miles keeps the watch out front. Everything is going pretty well to plan so far. A gig like this is basically like a rinse and repeat for our little group. Hal soon finds me, leading me to the back entrance. Look, this door has no camera, no security system either. Can you believe it? Haley shakes their head in disbelief, pointing to a plastic device screwed into the wall beside the door. The camera up there is fake. It doesn't have wires or batteries. What? Really? Why would they do that? Haley gives a dry laugh. <laughs> How do you think his mistress enters without alerting his wife? And for that reason, the cameras inside are also easily turned off. Wow. Jackpot, I guess. Haley mumbles in agreement, while easily unlocking the nondescript back door. Can you grab Miles? By the time I returned with Miles in tow, Haley had already dismantled the indoor cameras. We enter in the mansion, the marble floors clicking under Hal's boots. Hal turns to us. So, everyone remembers the plan, right? There is some silence, and then Miles leans over to me, whispering, Ugh. Plan? Miles, do you seriously have to forget every time? Miles pushes up his sweatshirt sleeves and holds up his arms. I wrote it on here, but then it kind of washed off in the shower. Haley face palms with a groan. Well, thank God for that. You could just wear a shirt that says, I'm going to rob this house instead if you wanted. Oh, was that part of the plan? No! I could almost see the migraine surfacing on Haley's forehead. Miles, first, move the car to the back exit route, then you watch the cameras on your phone. If you give us a heads up the second you see someone coming, it gives us a five minute heads up, which should be more than enough to get out of here in time. Miles nods, giving a thumbs up. Haley turns to me, about to ask if I know my assignment, but I give them a small nod. All right, let's get going. This is a quick in and out. We break and I immediately head to my location upstairs. Soon I find the master bedroom and start digging in any drawers I can find. I place aside any item that looks like it may be worth something, making sure to throw some clothes around as I go so the scene appears as if the robbery was done quickly. But I know exactly what I'm looking for. I easily sift through the nightstands, then make my way to the closet next. I open the closet and blanch at the incredible amount of stuff. Books, clothes, pictures, perfumes, jewelry, boxes. The value in this closet alone could have estimated a million easily. After stretching my neck a bit, I get to work. I start pulling out fabric, jewelry, digging through boxes. Wow, that's a lot of crap. I near jump out of my skin at the sound of Hal's voice. Fluff, Hal! Are you a ghost or something? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to sneak up on you there. Did you already get the files? Yep, I didn't even have to force my way in or take the drive. The password was literally his mistress's birthday. 34 years younger than him, by the way. Gross. Haley nods in agreement. You need any help? I could use some, yeah. Haley jumps in on my search, throwing valuables in my growing pile and taking extra care to search through the boxes. A couple minutes go by as we search and sift in silence. Oh my god, look at this crap! I glance up and Haley is sporting the most ridiculous hat I've ever seen, puke green, fur trimmed, satin diamond encrusted. I laugh at the absurd hat, 
so out of place on Haley's head. Okay, now that is a darn war crime. I turn around, grabbing a piece of clothing from the ground. But is it as bad as this? I put on an ostentatious silver jacket made in a shiny material that would confound scientists across the globe. The shoulder pads let out an obnoxious squeak as I pose like a model for Haley. Haley's laugh bubbles over. <laughs> Personally, it's not high fashion enough for me yet, darling. Haley purses their lips snootily in an exaggerated, joking expression. Now if you add some of these, we can talk. Haley holds out a pair of sunglasses for me to take. They resemble a single black bar that reached dangerous horizontal lengths. I take the sunglasses, putting them on. I feel like I could walk the runway in these. I strut around and attempt to do a fashion spin, but the glasses get caught on the corner of the wall. They snap in two, with half still on my face. We keel over in laughter. Aw, are you guys having fun without me? Miles appears in the doorway. Whoa, sick fits! I gotta get styled too! Miles scours the piles of clothing and lands on a harsh pink and green bodycon dress. He smiles, deviously, fitting it narrowly over his jeans and sweatshirt. Do I look pretty? You are the prettiest Miles in the whole world. Miles takes on a cutesy pose and a southern accent. Aw, shucks. Y'all make me feel like a million bucks. I walk over and put some all too large sunglasses on Miles' face. Now you're pretty and mysterious. Do you think I can seduce a widowed old man in these? Seduce? Not sure. Rob a bank, though? Definitely. Miles looks off into the distance, deep in thought. Kind of the same thing, if you think about it. The three of us continue trying on clothing, joking, soon dancing and singing, wearing ridiculous coats, scarves, dresses, boots. Haley spins me while we dance together. I lose my footing, tripping over a dress, or maybe a necklace. A large painting topples over as I bump into it, knocking it off the wall. Underneath the painting is a safe. We all stare, shocked. Hey guys, I think we found it. They look at the safe. That's definitely it. How much do you want to bet it's the same password? The mistress's birthday? He wouldn't. That would be so... ka -chunk. Dumb. Haley opens the safe, smiling confidently at me. They take out the documents, sifting through them. This is it. We got him. Let's pack it up and... A light flashes into the house from the driveway. Miles, when was the last time you checked the cameras? Miles holds up his phone. The screen is black. Oh yeah, my phone kind of died. Fluff, we gotta go now! I gather up what I can of the valuables and we break into a sprint down the hallway. Then the stairs. The light approaches, bouncing on the windows, illuminating us. A string of curses spilled from my lips as my legs carry me as fast as they can through the long hallways. As we finally make it to the back door, I hear the lock click on the front door. Haley already has the car started as I hop in the back of the convertible. We peel out of the back exit as the light turns on in the house, my heart beating a hundred miles an hour. We hit the road with speed, heading north into the night. We did it! Oh, thank God, we did it! Heck yeah! Woo! We celebrate and shout, driving into the night. After a few hours, we begin to slow as we drive through a small town. Let's get some food and bowling. Bowling? Haley pulls up to a large building labeled in neon lights as 24-hour bowling and diner. My treat tonight. Haley swivels their head, looking at both Miles and I. You guys aren't tired yet, right? Bowling? I love bowling! Miles gives a small whoop and eagerly jogs towards the building. Bowling it is, then. Haley strips their catsuit, changing into their usual fit. 
we walk into the bowling and diner combo. Surprisingly, it's quite busy. The usual patrons and workers seem to know Haley fondly, offering them free food and lanes. Haley turns them down, insisting on paying for our group. We walk up to the lane that has a small table in the back. I ordered us a bit of everything. Haley gets up and stretches. So, who's ready to get beat? Haley then types their name into the digital scoreboard. Miles hops up, also typing his name into the scoreboard. I follow, typing my name into the scoreboard as well. We start to bowl. Halfway through the game, our food arrives into the table, and we take a quick break to eat. I didn't realize how hungry I'd gotten. Miles takes out his phone and snaps pictures of his arm covered in Rolexes in front of the pancakes. Miles, you are posting that on the internet, right? Nah, Dad was wondering how the lessons were going. Miles, don't... Oh, Dad said he's gonna give you a bonus. Never mind then, carry on. I chew on some food thoughtfully. Miles, your dad really wants you to become a villain, huh? Yeah, he says it's in our blood, but I'm like, that's your dream, Dad, not mine. The old man says I'm a disgrace to the family, he just doesn't get it. Villains just aren't cool. I want to help people. Miles' usual cheery demeanor shrinks, and he hunches over, staring thoughtfully at the pancakes in front of him. A sympathetic look moves over Hal's face. Ha, ah, don't worry about it too much, Miles. Maybe, if we work hard, we can show him that it's not realistic for you to be a villain. Really? Hal smiles. Yeah, but let's not think about that for now. We got some bowling to do. Miles instantly cheers up, shooting forward from his seat to the lane. Despite how much they tend to bicker, Haley does seem to know how to cheer Miles up. He walks over and grabs a bowling ball, hurling it down the lane with a surprising amount of precision. Miles scores a strike, and Haley and I cheer for him. He looks so proud of himself. I look at Haley. I can tell they're genuinely enjoying themselves. Close to 4 a.m. in a diner that features both pancakes and bowling, something close to peace travels over me, and I can't help but to smile, too. In this moment, life felt so beautiful, felt so perfect. And I won't tell Miles that it was actually my turn that he threw that strike on. Eventually, we finish our game and our food. Miles was unexpectedly proficient at bowling. We leave the diner behind us as we drive out into the day. The sunrise greets us as the road paves our way forward to our next town, to our next adventure. Part of me never wants this beautiful moment to change. I stare at the familiar wall, its creases and marks unchanged. The couch I sit on feels no different from the one that I used to own. The living room even smells slightly of fresh flowers and wood. It's uncanny, as if I had been transported back in time. As if nothing had changed. But in reality, entirely too much had changed. The door clicks open. I don't even have to turn my head. I already know who it is. Not even a welcome home? He calls from the threshold as he enters. Welcome home. I mumble in response, devoid of all enthusiasm. Double doesn't say anything. Instead, he continues to the kitchen, placing some things down. I stare at the wall. He walks over slowly. How was your day? I glare at him, refusing to answer. He smiles wide, enjoying my mirth. Aw, oh, don't be like that. Double walks over towards me. You really look like you want to hit me, you know. He reaches out his hand, brushing it against my cheek. I move my face away, but his hand follows. It's okay being upset, but you shouldn't carry that anger with you. It's unhealthy. He moves his hand, brushing a finger over my lip. I snap, biting him hard. 
the psycho doesn't even flinch. He just pulls his hand back and stares at the bite marks, curiously. He looks back at me, his eyes dark, previous humor gone. Double steps away, and I return to staring at the same far wall. Double crosses my vision. He walks up to the standing lamp. In one swift motion, Double pushes the lamp to the floor, shattering the glass shade. He casually stomps on the bulb that remained intact, breaking it too. Slowly, he picks up a large shard of glass. He turns toward me, walking over slowly. As he approaches closer, I try to scramble away. But the heavy chain attached to the thick metal clamp around my neck keeps me imprisoned to a three feet radius of the couch. I scramble onto the hard floor by the far corner of the couch. I try to move further away, but Double brings his heavy boot down onto the chain. Come here! He bends down, picking up the chain in his other hand. I said, come here! He yanks the chain. I fall forward, palms catching the floor right by his boot. That pose looks good on you, sweetie. You should prostrate yourself more often. He laughs to himself, short and harsh. Look at me. I look upwards. Seems like you forgot how to be the lovely partner that you used to be. I look up at him, at the glass shard in his hand. My eyes shake and jump between the glass shard and his face. I will my eyes to not water. Oh, look at you. I just can't stay mad at you. Do you remember how to be my lover? Or do you need me to remind you of your dedication? I give Double a hard look. Remind me, Biscuit. I spit out with as much vitriol as I can manage. He smiles wide, crazed, excited. I was hoping you would say so. He nudges me with his foot. Sit up. Have some dignity. I do as I'm told. He crouches down in front of me, holding the shard of glass up. So, my love, where do you want your new tattoo? I will my eyes not to widen, my body not to shake. He's serious. I shift my body weight to show my side. Double's eyebrows shoot upwards in a rare show of genuine expression. He looks back up at me, and I smirk at him. This spot. He taps the glass shard against my hip, trailing it down, roughly catching on the fabric. Is where animals get branded, darling. Did you know that? Are you trying to appease me? Tease me? Or does it just come naturally to you? Unfortunately, I don't quite agree with your choice of location. His eyes brush across my body. I think... He brings a finger to the tip of my nose and trails it downwards. He stops his finger when it reaches just under my collarbone. Here is perfect. He brings his hand up to cup my chin. Now, honey... You can bite me this time. In fact, you'll probably need it. But be careful not to squirm too much. We don't want any mistakes, right? Double raises his hand up to my mouth, and I latch onto it. I'd rather give some pain back to him, even if it's his own decision. Wasting not a second longer, he presses the glass into my flesh. I scream, biting down into his hand at the breaking of my skin. He smiles at me as he carves with a steady hand. I continue to scream, muffled by his hand that remains firmly held between my teeth. He carves slowly with diligence. The seconds linger as if they were hours. I can feel his carving, my split flesh, the warm blood rolling down my chest. My body breaks out into sweat and tears roll down my cheek, some hit the open wound, making it sting harshly. After what feels like an eternity, Double finally sighs and backs up. 
He drops the piece of glass to the ground and holds my shaking shoulders. Look at you. You are ephemeral. So lovely. He places kisses on my face, and I'm too in shock to even move away. The devil gets up. He moves away, soon returning with disinfectant supplies. He cleans and bandages up my wounds, taking time to wipe away my tears and whisper reassurances. Double scoops me up from the floor, setting me on the couch in his lap. He holds me tight, breathing in my scent. I missed you all day, honey. Couldn't wait to get back home and see you. I couldn't get myself to speak. What movie do you want to see this weekend for our date? Let's stop by the bookstore after. I stay silent. In the before times, Double and I used to go out for a date every weekend. He would treat me to a movie, a coffee, ice cream, books, various knickknacks. Anything I looked at for a second too long became mine, even if I didn't particularly want it. Eventually, his behavior became so problematic that it was more stressful to be outside with him than it was to be behind closed doors. Um, it's okay. I... Double moves his head back and looks at me with dead eyes. Excuse me? Yeah, I... I can't wait. He smiles, hugging me again. His hugs felt suffocating. I needed to get away from him. Double... I look up at him. He stares down at me, looking slightly happy that I called him by his name. Can I... make us dinner tonight? He looks at me, stares at me, scanning my intentions. I want to make us something nice. After staring at me for a bit longer, he smiles. Sure. He pulls me closer by the chain, so our noses are almost touching. I can feel his breath dust over my face. He takes his time as he reaches into his pocket, grabbing the key to the heavy lock that binds my neck. I squirm, attempting to relieve my back of the tension caused by the awkward position. Double smirks a little. He brings the key to my neck. Kachink. The heavy lock falls to the wayside along with the metal clasp. Double smiles as if he did me a favor. Go get him, tiger. I stand up, stretching my wobbly legs, and make my way slowly over to the kitchen. Some part of me feels enraged at how weak my legs have grown after weeks of not enough use. I lean on the countertop as I hear Double pick up his phone. I spot his outer jacket draped over the bar chair. I wobble over to the jacket, praying to God that it had a spare key in one of the pockets. I rifle through quickly. All of the pockets feel empty, aside from one. My hand brushes against a hard object and a pointy object. I pull out one of th I pull out the objects. One is a small key that looks exactly like the key that Double used on my collar. I don't have any pockets, so I tuck it inside the waist of my panties as snugly as I can manage. I pull out the second object. It's a small, deep black velvet box. My heart pounds, and my hands sweat as I open the box slowly. My fears surface as I eye the gorgeous ring. The ring shines in the kitchen light. I hear the couch creak as Double gets up. I quickly shove the ring back into the jacket pocket. My heart is pounding. Everything is quiet. I open the cupboard and close it. Double takes another phone call. I look at his jacket pocket again. Is he really? My palms sweat. My chest pounds and I start to feel nauseous. I avert my gaze, looking around the kitchen instead. My eyes land on a large knife. I look back at the tan jacket, mocking me, taunting me. I pick up the knife, looking at myself in the reflection. I then glance back at the tan, irritating jacket, the disgusting lump lurking the pocket. I feel... 
I feel indignant. My hand tightens around the knife. I smile in the reflection, my resolve thickening. How are things going? Double calls to me from the other room. I smile, heart beating a thousand miles an hour. Great! I'm making you the perfect dish. I walk towards the edge of the kitchen, pressing myself against the wall. Come have a taste, honey. I smile at my reflection in the knife. If I can't have my freedom, I might as well take what I can from him. I hear his footsteps approaching. I grip the knife, stealing my resolve. You want me double? You're gonna get me. The aroma of oil and garlic fill Binary Star's kitchen. I sit there, staring at him from the dining room table. He catches my gaze and gives me one of his iconic smiles. It's shallow, able to be swept away by a change in tide. Be a dear and set the table? Ray asks, his eyes shifting back to his pan in his hands. His calm yet confident voice carries over the soft music that hums in the background. I get up and grab two plates from his cupboard. He watches me pass by, but dares not to reach out towards me. Despite living together, we haven't had much intimacy yet. Things were nice and rosy for a while, but the longer he is Binary Star, the less I've seen Ray. Between Binary Star and Ray, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure if I understand either. Half of the time, I'm not even sure who I'm talking to anymore. Things start to get tense when he couldn't find Double. After a few weeks, Binary Star decided it would be better if he stopped trying. His search extended too far, and it was dangerous to be away from me for so long. So instead, he watches over me in his skyscraper apartment. Every now and then, Ray disappears for a couple of days, sometimes hurt, other times not. I recently noticed the number of abilities he has must be increasing. His mental state seems changing too. When he doesn't notice me looking, his facial expression seems truly empty. Devoid of anything that resembles a human. It worries me, but I don't even know how to ask if he's okay. It made me realize I knew Binary Star even less than I thought I did. I set the table nicely, putting wine glasses out along with water glasses. When Ray plates the food, I place it on the table too. I sit down in my seat, in the way that has become all too normal. With a light pop, Ray opens a wine bottle, bringing it to the table. Would you like some? Yes. I nod lightly, and Ray gives a tasteful pour into my glass. I watch, mesmerized by the dark red liquid, as it lightly ebbs against the crystal. Ray pours himself some, and sits it on the table. We start to eat. Silence rests over the soft music. Music Ray somehow knew that I liked. Is it alright? I nod. It's very good. Great! I learned this recipe to cook for you specifically. I was hoping you would enjoy it. I look up, a shallow, bright smile adorning his expression. We fall back into silence, only accompanied by the light clattering of utensils. Soon enough, the dinner is over, and Ray takes my plate. I get up from my seat, wine glass and water glass in hand. Ray. He turns around at the sound of my voice. I really need to go outside. His face immediately falls, shedding the mask he so often wears. I, I can't stay all cooped up like this. Ray places the plates in the sink with a sigh. He washes his hands and dries them off. Every elongated second makes me more nervous. Ray finally approaches me. As he walks over, there is a loud explosion. The ground shakes and the lights flicker. I stumble, dropping the crystal wine glass which shatters on the ground. The flickering light reflects off of the hundreds of glass shards, illuminating them like stars. Don't move. Ray is over me in a split second. 
He leans down, gently scooping me into his arms, and lifting me up without an ounce of effort. Ray holds me in his arms as he saunters over to the window. My star. Look. I look up at him. He stares out of the tall window, one of the many that line his apartment. I follow his gaze, my eyes landing on a dark cloud that begins to cover the other side of the city. They're back. The aliens begin to stalk across the city, destroying, decimating as they please. Yes. It's unsafe for you to go out there. The heroes aren't equipped to protect the city any longer from those things. He smiles at me, then turns back to the window. But the aliens, they're smart. They won't bother us. So the whole city will be ours. We won't ever have to worry about Double coming after you again. I press my finger against the window. The alien moves underneath it, flames and smoke trailing behind. What happened to the other heroes? Ray looks down at me. He gives a sad smile. They couldn't keep up with the demand. The aliens got smarter, but the heroes didn't. Between the aliens and villains, heroes just started to drop like flies. It's a harsh world out there. I watch as more aliens move across the horizon, the glass chill on my fingertip. As I watch a tower in the distance topple and crumble, it makes me feel... It makes me feel scared. These terrifying beasts lurk and kill. We have no real idea how many of them there are. What they plan to do. Ray holds me a bit tighter. Don't worry. I'll protect you till my last breath. They won't be able to touch a hair on your head. It's painful now, but it will be good for us in the end. I watch someone running for their life, only to be picked up like a toy. How will this ever be good for us? For anyone? You won't have to worry about double anymore. I look at the carnage below. It's not worth it. Ray looks at me, his jaw set ever so slightly. How could my safety be worth this? Hundreds of lives. Thousands. The other heroes may not be able to do anything, but you could stop it, Ray. You could save them. Ray sets me to my feet. He gives me a hard look, studying my face. No. What? What do you mean? Like, you can't, or do you not want to? I have everything I could ever want right here. If this opportunity makes life better for us, I'd be a fool to stop it. Your safety is what is most important. Over the lives of thousands of people? That doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. Ray. It can't just be us. Ray frowns. The expression felt real. It felt honest. He leans in. I take a step back, but my back is pressed against the cold glass. Star. It is just us. It's always been just us. Ray, please! My pleas fall on deaf ears. He turns to walk away. Some part of me knows I have one more chance. Ray, please save them. I collapse on my knees. Sobs rack my body. Ray pauses. He turns around, looking at my pitiful state. As I sob, Ray slowly approaches me. He crouches down and wipes away my tears. Please! Please, Ray, please! I sob like a broken record. A carousel of conflicted expressions drift across his face. Ray wipes away my tears, placing kisses on my cheeks, lips, and nose. Just don't think about it, Star. It will be easier that way. I can't just not think about it. So many people will die because of me. I can't live like that. I, I can't go on living knowing that... Well, I won't let you die either. Then what am I supposed to do, Ray? Tell me. If this happens, 
If people die like that, I can't forgive myself. I'll curse myself and spiral into despair. I look up at him, glaring fiercely. I'll begin to hate you, too. Ray smiles, softly. Then hate me. Hate me like it's your last connection to sanity. You can curse me, hit me, ignore me until you've had your fill. I'll take all of it. Your hate, anger, sadness. I'll take it all. Every darn day if it means that you'll be safe and alive at my side. I bury my face in my hands, the feeling of defeat washing over me. Ray reaches out, and I grasp him. I curse him. I curse him and curse him while hugging him tightly, sobbing, screaming, crying into his shirt. Even as the cause of my pain, he's the only one I could reach out to for comfort. Part of me wondered if he intended that all along, or if we just happened to end up here. No, to the wine. I'm okay, I think. He smiles. Probably for the best. What's that supposed to mean? I didn't mean it as an insult. Only that alcohol doesn't have the health properties people say that it does. I nod, lightly. He smiles again. Will the aliens stop at just this city? Ray gives me a measured look. Then he smiles. It's hard to say. My guess would be no, but who knows? I watch as more aliens move across the horizon, the glass chill on my fingertip. It makes me feel... sad. This beautiful city, destroyed. For what? People suffering. For what? If nobody understands the intentions of these monsters, how can we even begin to process the loss, to mourn for each other? I bite my lip to keep the tears from spilling over. Ray places a kiss on my head, his warmth lingering. Everything will be okay, I promise. Don't be sad. You should be happy, my shining star. It's painful now, but it will be good for us in the end. What if it's not just us? Ray pauses. He turns around, slowly. What? What if there can be someone else, too? Ray walks over, slowly. Are you saying what I think you're saying? I don't want to raise our family in an alien-infested, destroyed city. Ray's eyes widen. He searches my face, my mind trying to determine if this is my attempt at humor. Our family? Ray approaches closer. He places a hand on my face, cupping it lightly. Our family. Binary Star places a deep kiss onto my lips. I can feel his hands shake slightly. He pulls back, breathlessly. I don't think I've been happier in my whole life than in this moment. I want our kids to have friends, neighbors, companions in the same city they grew up in. Kids? He kisses me again, pulling back. There's so much love in his eyes, it threatens to knock me off my feet. I just can't say no to you, Star. Ray kisses me again, lifting me up, pressing my back against the glass. M Ray... M I push him back a bit, and he obliges, leaning back, looking down at me, a heat swirling behind his eyes. Can you please go save them? He looks at me intensely, unmoving. Let me taste you a bit first. I'll take care of it right after. His hand grips my thigh as he leans in closer to my neck. R Ray! His lips trail my neck nibbling and licking as they move their way north towards my ear. Hmm? Ray, later, please. He leans back again as I cover my neck against any future attacks. He stares blankly. Right, when you get back, I promise. 
After a few seconds, Ray lets out a deep sigh. Fine, I'll go. He lowers my feet to the ground and backs up. Ray begins to saunter off. I can tell by his walk that he's dreading getting back into the suit. Wait, Ray, you forgot something. Ray turns around, confused. I bound towards him, placing a kiss onto his cheek. I whisper to him. Thank you, Ray. You're my hero. Ray's face heats up, a light pink, and he can't hide a small, genuine smile. Go get some sleep, Star. I'll see you when I get back. Ray leaves the condo, and I collapse onto the couch. A whirlwind of emotions fly through me. Eventually enough time has passed that Ray is likely not in a near enough vicinity to hear my thoughts. Honestly, the stuff about family was a last-ditch effort, the only thing I could think of at the time. Part of me wasn't even sure I wanted kids. A larger part of me wasn't sure if I wanted kids with Ray himself. It was the best I could do at the time to convince him. And I thank my lucky stars that it worked. I guaranteed a future, not only for myself, but for the rest of the city's citizens. I likely guaranteed a future for Ray himself as well. Something deep inside of Ray is deeply wrong, misformed, and ever-growing. I can't ignore something like that any longer. I need to keep him moving, motivated. Because some part of me can't shake the feeling that the minute Binary Star stops moving is the minute everything else does too. The sunlight shines through the large windows. I turn in the bed, my hand brushing against an unfamiliar emptiness beside me. It's still partially warm. It must have recently gotten up. I stretch and rise out of bed, greeting the new day with a tired body. My feet travel over the heated ground as I move through the spacious condo. The sound of coffee being brewed echoes in the air. I make my way to the kitchen. As I round the corner, I see Ray leaning against the counter, looking over a stack of papers. Good morning, I yawn. He looks up, slightly surprised, placing the stack onto the table as he makes his way over to me. Oh, good morning, Star. How did you sleep? He places a kiss on the top of my head. I slept well. I think I slept pretty well. Ray smiles softly straightening out my bunched-up shirt. You sure look like you slept pretty well. I pull a face and Ray laughs. <laughs> Don't pout, Star. You look cute. You were so peaceful while asleep. I tried my best not to wake you when I got up. Ew. You were staring at me while I was sleeping? You creep. I tease him back. A flash of annoyance drifts across Ray's expression. Keep taunting me and I'll take you right back to bed, he warns, coolly. I shut my mouth and sit down on one of the kitchen seats. Do you want any coffee? Ray asks while picking up a mug. Yes. Please. Ray pulls out a second mug, pouring a generous amount. Milk? Sugar? I help up, moving to my mug. I got it, I say, grabbing the mug and preparing my coffee to my taste. I bring the coffee back to my seat and relax into it. I can't help but to sigh after taking my first sip. Nothing beats coffee in the morning. I glance over at the papers that he was looking through. His eyes follow my own, and he walks over, picking them up. Ray gives a tired smile and places them on the sleek countertop in front of me. Some rental properties? I shift through the stack of apartments. A good portion of them are pretty solid finds. You said the last ones were too expensive, so I tried to find something a bit more reasonable for you. I continue to flip through them. You didn't have to find all of these for me, I say, feeling a little guilty. I glance up at Ray. He smiles at me in an embarrassed way, probably realizing he may have overdone it a tad. Well, you said being here was temporary, and you wanted your own place. But of course, you're more than welcome to stay here. In fact, I would love you to. 
I look at Ray. He seems genuine. I do care about him, and I like being around him. But our relationship, or whatever this is, didn't really start out on the best footing. And I can't just live with him. I need to rebuild trust with him first. We can take it slow. Take all the time needed to rebuild it. Ray. Oh, sorry. He cringes. We previously set boundaries where Ray would not read my mind, but after a lifetime of old habit, a new habit can be hard to build. I didn't... I'm... We're learning. It's okay. Ray smiles, seeming genuinely relieved. I dog-eared the ones that I thought looked good. I started flipping through, looking at all of the bookmarked ones. Something similar seemed to carry throughout all of them. Are... Are all of these within a three-block vicinity from here? Ray gives a little smirk, sipping his coffee. I still want you to be close to me, Star. Sue me. Ray gives me an indecipherable look. You should be happy I'm even letting you go. A second passes before he smiles. Kidding. He was not kidding. So, what are your plans for today? I think for a moment, but decide on not responding to his former statement. Probably job hunting. Visit some of these rentals. This one looks pretty good. I say, pulling a paper from the stack. Ray sips his coffee, looking thoughtfully. Sounds nice. Maybe I'll join. I don't remember inviting you, and... Don't you have work? Ray sits down his coffee. He brushes a hand through his hair. Mmm, not really feeling it today. Ray, you protect the whole city. What do you mean you don't feel like it? They can deal with me skipping a day. If the city can't protect itself for a single day, it doesn't deserve to have the peace that it does. Didn't that supervillain Vandal announce that he was going to attack the city today? Ray sips some coffee, waving his hand dismissively. Not my problem, he states dismissively. Plus, I'm depressed. The object of my love and affections is moving out. Ray gives a sad expression that was obviously forced. I think I might have to lie in bed and watch sitcoms all day. He's really playing it up. You hate sitcoms. Nature documentaries, then. Depressed people don't watch nature documentaries. Oh, so first you break my heart, and now you put me in a box? You are so ruthless, Star. Ray cracks a smile, unable to keep a straight face. You are so insufferable. I learned from the best brat around. He gives me a cocky wink. Ray starts to rinse his mug. Ray, are you really not going to protect the city? Ray doesn't answer and just places his mug in the dishwasher. I get up and approach the tired-looking blonde man. Ray, please... No. Ray! Ray sighs, his shoulders slumping. Fine, but I need to steal some energy from you first. What? Ray turns around and wraps me in a tight hug. His arms and chest surround me like a cocoon, his soft sweater plush against my face. His hot breath brushes along my ear, making goosebumps rise on my skin. My face heats up and I start to squirm. He continues to hold me. I can feel his calm, steady heartbeat. Something in me knew he was holding on to me, as if I was his last thread to this world. Stay with us, Ray. Don't disappear. He breathes me in and exhales, grounding himself to humanity. A minute or so passes. Finally, Ray pulls back. Okay, sorry. I feel energized again. I'll go to work now. Sorry for worrying you, Star. I look at the tired man, leaned over the sink. His pale hair slips over his shoulders as he works. The dull shine sparkles in the sun that peeks through the window. Despite his past, despite his perceived failures, despite his agony, hatred, contempt, he was fighting still, fighting against the hardest competitor, himself. He turns to finish the rest of the dishes. Ray, I call to him. 
He turns slightly to look at me. I take the opportunity to cup his face, bringing his lips to mine. I kiss him deeply, with so much care. At first his eyes are wide, shocked. Then he deepens the kiss, dropping whatever he was holding to wrap his arms around me, to press himself into me more desperately than before. I correct my arms, wrapping them around his neck. He walks me backwards a bit as he pushes into me, threading the kiss even deeper. I finally break away, looking up at him, breathless. How was that for some energy? I smirk at him. His eyes stare at me with molten heat. I'm going to be late for work, he states, matter-of-factly, before picking me up with ease. He carries me out of the kitchen and towards the bedroom. Ray looks at me with so much love in his eyes. I'm not sure either of us thought we would end up here. Loved and being loved, being loved and loved. The future may not be the smoothest of roads. Between us, there is a lot damaged, a lot broken. There's a chance that we can't repair it, that two broken people only serve to shatter each other more to pull each other apart. But right now, in this singular moment in time, I needed Ray, and Ray needed me. As if it was foreseen in the stars, we met. We collided. The gravitational pull keeping us in a preordained dance. We orbit each other. I... I think I had a nightmare. Ray's face looks concerned. His voice comes out gentle, slow. Do you want to talk about it? I shake my head lightly. I'm not sure that it makes sense, even if I tried. Ray smiles sympathetically. He walks closer. I used to have nightmares pretty often as a kid. What helped you get rid of them? He smiles softly. Well, I don't think I ever really got rid of them. After a while, you just get used to them. They eventually just stop being scary. He brushes down some of my bedhead. I know. Probably not what you want to hear, huh? No, but some part of me had a feeling that was the case. I think I just gotta work through them. Ray places a kiss on my cheek. You can always talk to me about them, if you want to. You know that, right? I bite my lip and nod. Ray smiles. Good. Do you want any coffee? Ray asks while picking up a mug. No, thank you. Ray pours himself a cup and starts to sip. Hmm, more for me, I guess. Knock yourself out, old man. Huh? A look of shock hits Ray's face. He starts to cough. <coughs> old man? Excuse me? He places the coffee cup down. I am not an old man. You drink coffee like one. What? What does that mean? Ray looks genuinely confused. I can't help but to laugh. Ray approaches, and my laughter is soon cut short as he looms above where I sit. My star. Are you really messing with me at 8.30 in the morning? I bat my eyes, attempting to look innocent. Ray lets out a groan rubbing his eyes while walking back to the counter. I should have started drinking coffee earlier, if I knew you were going to come out of the bed gosh darn swinging. You're a fluffing menace. Do your best today. Ray looks at me, curiously. You can do it! I give a small fist bump, getting embarrassed as I try to cheer on Ray. <laughs> Ray covers his face, turning away. I knew he was trying his hardest not to laugh at me. Oh my god, Ray, you're so rude! I pout, crossing my arms, looking at him through knitted eyebrows. <laughs> Ray laughs, genuinely, his eyes creasing and eyebrows pressing upwards. My pout softens as I realize I've never actually seen him laugh genuinely before. He reaches over and ruffles my hair. You are just too gosh darn cute. You know that? What am I going to do with you, Star? I was just trying to cheer you on. I mumble, looking away, face red. 
Ray puts his hand up in defeat, smiling. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh, really. I promise I won't laugh next time. I look at him, skeptically. I swear it. Fine. He approaches me, cupping my face. Ray smiles at me warmly. Please cheer me on again, Star. He mumbles to me in a soft voice, leaning down and placing a tender kiss on my cheek. My face heats up once again. Fine. Ray looks at me with so much love in his eyes. I'm not sure either of us thought we would end up here. Loved and being loved. Being loved and loved. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Z? You sneaky, gosh darn muffins. You absolute strawberries. You sweet little basket of apples. I'm putting that in there. I'm putting that in there. There's more? You sneaky, sneaky. You sneaky, sweet pumpkins. You adorable basket of apples. There's more? I just turned off all my recording stuff. I thought I was done. I'm not done. There's more. Why did that look like the thing from Favor? Is Z gonna come to the coffee shop? Do they take place in the same universe? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Not many people coming or going. I can't help but space out. My eyes blur as I fight to keep focus and stay alert. Maybe I can use some coffee myself. My eyes trace the subtle grooves and crevices of the countertop as I space out. Hello? Can I, uh, order a coffee? I glance, upwards, my eyes meeting the strange customer's form. They smile, their mouth full of sharp teeth. They sport some sharp horns and a peculiar tail. No one told you it's rude to stare? Oh, sorry. I'm just teasing. You can keep looking. I don't mind. I clear my throat and shift on my feet, uncomfortable. His sharp teeth gleamed in the light. So what would you recommend here? Well, it depends on what you're feeling. What do you think I'm craving? I'll give you... One guess. Oh yeah? What do I get if I guess right? The customer looks amused. He leans in. Whatever you want. I laugh at the bold proclamation. You will give me whatever I want. Yes. But the question you should be asking is... What will I take? If you lose. Well, the last time I lost a game, I lost a finger, so... If that's all you want... I knot my eyebrows. Their tones seemed friendly, but something screamed in me that danger slithered under the surface. Well then, what will you take? They just smile. You like surprises, don't you? I do, but not in this case, sir. I... I'm not sure. The customer leans back. Give it a go. <laughs> um... Um... Black coffee? My boyfriend likes black coffee. They tilt their head. Quizzically. It's not bad, but also not what I'm craving right now. Sir! Well, I guess I lost then. <laughs> Which finger do you want? And I win. I feel like you somehow rigged this. They smile innocently. Oh dear. Oh me, oh my. Stop! What a sore loser. 
The customer openly mocks me, cackling loudly. You are such an a-hole. You love that about me, though. I know y'all can't see the face I'm making, but I'm making a face. I did not intend to, to do recording today. You love me. What? No, I don't. I don't even know you. Yes, you do. No, I... 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 I don't... <laughs> My head begins to reel. My surroundings feel... wrong. You didn't even ask yet. Oh no! The customer leans on the counter, looking down at me. I back up a bit, frazzled by the sudden closeness. Ask... Ask what? Ask what are you doing here, Z? I start to feel dizzy. What I get to take now. Oh, you should stop playing around. No, you lost. So now you pay the price. Gulp. R Ray? Ray? Ray! The customer, Z, leans in close. With your sleep. Ah. My jaw drops. W w what? I'm taking your sleep from you. Ah! Z leans in close. They whisper to me. Wake up. It's time to wake up, sweetheart. Join me. Wake up. Okay, so you hold on a second now. You're not gonna Tate Frost me. You hold, you, you hold on a second. Fine, decaf coffee, the obviously wrong answer. A blank expression crosses their face. It's like you don't even know me at all. Well, I, I knew that was obviously the wrong answer, but... Well, I guess I lost then. And I win. Okay, what about my favorite, a caramel latte? <laughs> oh, human. I'd drink it if you made it. But not right now. Hey. Well, I guess I lost then. What? And I win. You biscuit! Join me. Wake, Wake up. up.